So, um, so for today, we're going to do a little bit of hands-on and a little bit of slides as we talk about neonatal ventilation. Sawa? Some of you are from NICU. Yes. Some of you from ICU. Some of you from somewhere else. Sawa. <laughs> Um, so, in some ways, neonatal ventilation is very similar to adults, okay? And then there's some ways where it's different. And if a neonatal, neonatologist hears me say, oh, they're the same as adults, they will get mad at me. But in some ways, they're the same, okay? So, what I want to talk about is what's different. Sawa? Um, so, as we start, let's... Review quickly the modes, okay? So we have two types of modes. We have a cis control and SIMB. Those are two mo main mode types. In a cis control, the vent delivers a full volume or a full pressure breath, depending if you're on volume assist control or pressure assist control, whether it's the patient deciding they want a breath or a machine wanting a breath, right? So assist control does it all. Okay, very helpful. I've got that strong, capable lady that she does it all. That's what you think about when it's cyst control, okay? Compared to SIMB. SIMB can be a little bit lazy. SIMB says, okay, you told me to give a rate of 20. I'll give 20 breaths a minute. If the patient wants 30, ah, they're on their own, okay? But SIMB's little sister pressure support sometimes comes along and helps out. And so if we're set at a rate of 20, and the patient wants to breathe at 30, we can program in pressure support to help. Does that make sense? So assist control, the machine is gonna help com completely. If the rate is set at 10, the patient is going to get 10 breaths minimum. And if they want more, the machine's gonna give them more breaths that look identical. And SIMB, if they want more breaths, they have to do more work themselves, okay? Then we also have volume modes and pressure modes. Sawa? So volume, the machine delivers your breath until you get a set amount of volume. We call that the tidal volume. Tidal volume is air in one breath, okay? And depending what's going on with the lungs, the pressure will vary, okay? Um, so if we're ventilating these lungs and they're small and I'm keeping them closed, going to get a lot of pressure to try to get that volume in, right? If I relax it and I'm even pulling, it'll take less pressure. Is that what? Um, and so on volume control, we are going to set the volume. And normally for neonates, we do about five to eight mils per kilo. So if your patient is two kilos, how much volume would that be? 16 or as low as 10, right? And we want to keep our pressures mostly less than 30, and more volume is going to create more pressure. Sawa? So compared to pressure control, the machine delivers a set pressure with each breath, and whatever volume the patient gets, they get. So if I am holding the lung closed and it's really tight, the machine's going to give a little bit of pressure. Are we going to get a lot of volume? No. If I let the lung relax, we're going to get more volume, right? So the volume's going to change breath by breath. The other important thing to remember with volume control versus pressure control is the machine is measuring how much air leaves, okay, and how much air comes back. It's not it, there's no measurement sitting in the lung to measure how much enters, okay? And this matters when we get to neonates, and I'll explain why in a minute. So in pressure control, the machine's going to keep giving air to, re to stay at its pressure. In volume control, it's going to say, okay, 10 mils, huisha, to me melisa, right? And so that's one of the challenges with neonates. So one of the challenges is the volume is small, right? If we have a one kilo patient, we're giving between five and 10, is there a focus on here somewhere? Not this one. We're giving between five and 10, <coughs> sorry, five to eight mils, 
right? How, if, so, if you need to, if you have a child and you need to give them five mils of paracetamol, do you just guess? No, you have to draw up very carefully, right? And so for these machines to measure that precisely can sometimes be a problem, okay? Um, the other problem with neonates is we use an uncuffed tube. So the one thing that they kept telling me that I was when I was back in school, which was now a long time ago, is air takes the path of least resistance. <coughs> so when it leaves the endotracheal tube, when it's at the tip of the endotracheal tube, it has a choice. It can enter the lungs or it can escape out the top around the tube, right? If there's a cuff tube, it can't escape out the top, right? But if it's an uncuffed tube, the air can escape <coughs> around the sides of the tube. Sawa? And so if your patient has healthy lungs, it might be easy for the air to go in the lungs. But if the lungs are a little bit unhealthy, it's going to be easier <coughs> for it to escape around. So we then have air leaking, and we don't know where it's going, OK? And that can make things challenging. Some machines measure volumes when it leaves the vent, OK? They measure it over here, some machines. Then we have all of this that we're also ventilating. These tubings can move a little bit when we're ventilating, right? So this movement can also affect your volumes. Um, And so that can cause problems when we're ventilating neonates. The other problem with neonates is machines want to be able to sense when the patient is breathing, okay? And they do that by recognizing either decreases in pressure or, decre or changes in flow. But if you have a leak and air is escaping, we're going to have a drop in pressure or we're going to have a change in flow, okay? So the biggest problems for neonates is we sometimes use uncuffed tubes and we're dealing with really small numbers, okay? So how can we mitigate these challenges? First is can we measure the volume here instead of here? And your machine is great. It's got a flow sensor at the patient Y. We call this a patient Y because it sort of looks like a letter Y, yes? So you don't have to worry about tube air being lost to the tubing because we're measuring it at the patient Y. But if we decide to put another piece of tubing in between here, between before the endotracheal tube, we're going to create problems, right? Um, the other thing is to use an endotracheal tube that's the right size for the patient. Um, and so if you have a large leak, sometimes we have to put in a bigger tube. Sawa? Use a cuffed tube. I asked for someone to bring me some tubes, and it looks like most of them are cuffed. Um, so that also helps with your challenges. Then the other one is adjust the trigger to ensure no auto-triggering. So auto-triggering is when the machine thinks the patient wants a breath, and the patient actually doesn't want a breath. And this can sometimes be hard to tell. You're looking at your baby and going, are they breathing at 70, or is the machine confused and breathing for them at 70? And an easy thing to do is just quickly, not for long, just quickly disconnect them from the vent and look at their chest and abdomen movements. If they keep breathing at a rate of 70, okay, they want to breathe at 70. If you take them off and, they're and they are not breathing, then the machine is recognizing something that's not there, okay? And we'll try to simulate for that for you guys shortly. So, so far so good. All right, so when we talk about this, pressure control for neonates can be better than volume control because it allows us to monitor, manage these risks a little bit better. If you have air leaking and we've told the machine this baby is two kilos and therefore we want to give 10 mils and five mils are escaping, but if five mils left here, or sorry, if 10 mils left here, the machine says, I did my job, right? It doesn't matter, I, I'm done. I don't know what your problem is, <laughs> right? So 
In pressure control go, the machine says, no, 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 if air is escaping, I'm not meet, reaching my pressure, and I keep trying, and I keep pushing more and more and more and more until we reach that pressure. So if you have a leak, sometimes pressure control works better. Um, realizing then the machine tells us volumes, but those might not be accurate, okay? So when you're on pressure control, you wanna look at those volumes and see what they are. But if you have a leak, and a big way to tell that is a big difference between your inhaled and your exhaled volumes, you say, you know what, those numbers don't mean anything. My volumes might be 20, my inhaled volume is 20, my exhaled volume is five. In reality, I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't know. But do I have good chest rise? When I listen to the lungs, am I hearing air moving in and out, okay? Are we able to do blood gases on neonates here? No? No, okay. So you can also look at your CO2 if you're able, um, but that's not always the case. So does that make sense? So often we want to use pressure control for that reason. Then we have the question AC versus SIMV. If the machine thinks the patient is breathing more than they actually are, is it better for the machine to give a full breath or just a small lazy breath if it's an accidental breath? If it's an accidental breath, we don't want it to give a full breath, right? So for this reason, sometimes we prefer SIMV, even without pressure support. Um, because then if there's accidental breaths going in, we're, we don't risk hyperventilating that baby and breathing for them too much and doing damage. Um, so before you do this, try to reduce the leak. How do you think we can reduce a leak around an endotracheal tube? What I mentioned was to put in a bigger tube, right? How else can we maybe get rid of, rid of the leak? How do we like to position babies so their airways are open? We do this, right? So if they are on the vent, I want you to do the opposite. They have a tube in, their airway is patent. We want the tissues to close around the endotracheal tube. So don't hyperextend. Put them neutral. Or even a little bit less. <laughs> even flex kidogo, right? So that because we want air going through the tube and nowhere else, right? So I know we are in, I'm assuming you are like my team back home who is really good at hyperextending everybody because that's what we do. But once they are intubated, stop hyperextending. Leave them neutral, okay? Because that will help. So for all of these reasons, SIMV pressure control is historically the most common mode used for neonates, okay? Um, and a lot of books talk about it, and it's because it's only been in the last 10 years or so that we've had flow sensors at the patient's line, okay? It's only been in the last few years that we've been able, we've done more cuff tubes on neonates. Um, and this is not a bad thing. So if you're struggling, SIMV pressure control is a good place to start. Sawa? All right, so let's talk about a few other settings and then we're gonna set up uh, for, we're gonna intubate our patient and then we're going to set it up, all right? So other settings, tidal volume we talked about, five to eight mils per kilo. This is, for neonates we tend to use actual body weight, okay? For adults, we use ideal body weight, right? When someone grows obese, their lungs do not get better. But keep this in mind for neonates if you have a baby with some abnormality, maybe a really bad hydrocephalus or something, right? Then that weighs four kilos, but the body is the size of a two kilo baby, right? So um, respiratory rate, generally 30 to 40. Sometimes we go as high as 50, not often. Um, Inspiratory time, how long they spend breathing in. Generally 0.35 seconds to 0.45 seconds. One rule someone told me once and I thought was a little bit easy to remember was gestational age. If they are a term baby, they're 40 weeks, TI of 0.4. If they are born at 30 weeks, I'm going to do 0.3. 
All right. If they are post dates, I'm going to do 0.43. Does that make sense? That's an easy way to remember how it goes. A smaller baby, right, they breathe a little bit faster and they don't need as much time to breathe in. Um, PEEP. Who remembers what PEEP is? What does PEEP stand for? <coughs> Positive and expiratory pressure, right? So you want your PEEP to be from 5 up until 14. Okay, sometimes people think, oh, this baby is small, I don't want to use as much pressure. Yes, they are small, but if they need their lungs to be opened up, they need to be opened up. And so we still need to use those higher pressures at times. Sawa? Um, and then peak pressure, that max pressure, we should be less than 35. Okay? Knowing that there may be times when we have to go higher if we have really bad lungs. But then we're risk for, what happens if we give too much pressure? Pneumothorax and other barotrauma, right? So, neonatal endotracheal tubes. Intubation, the technique is a little bit, is mostly the same as an adult. Um, when we intubate, we like to use a straight blade laryngoscope instead of the curved ones that we like in adults, okay? The really, the other thing we need to remember is the tube is small. So we do, it takes a lot of work to get that tube in. So once we get it in, we don't want to lose it, okay? And so we need to be really careful that we hold our endotracheal tube well. So what are some ways I'm going to open one of these endotracheal tubes you gave me. I hope that's okay. So, I have my patient. And if I do this, let me see if this works. Let me try something here. Ooh, ha. And then I do. Aha! You guys see that? <laughs> so, if I'm intubating this patient, right, the doctor is going to use the blade, they're going to hold it in their left hand, they're going to put it in the mouth, and they're going to slide the tube in, okay? Once the tube is in, I might need a stylet. Once the tube is in, what keeps the tube from coming out? What do you think keeps the tube from coming out? We have to secure it. The cuff, if you have one, does not keep your tube in, okay? The trachea is very slimy. And because it's slimy, this stylet you get to keep. Go home with it. Um, not home, because you get you. Um, because the endotracheal tube is slimy, this little cuff, all it does is it, it's small, right? It allows us, when it's inflated, to keep a tight seal in the trachea, okay? But often we're using uncuffed tubes in neonates. Sometimes we're using cuffed. Um, so what keeps this tube in is you, okay? So once we get the tube in, I'm going to make this an uncuffed tube. Come on, tube. So once we get the tube in, I have to deflate our cuff here. We have to hold it, OK? How deep should a neonatal tube be in the lungs? What do you think? Depends on the weight. So an easy one I like is weight plus six. Okay? So this baby is about the size of what? A 1.5 kilo baby? <laughs> what do you think? Compared to my hand? 
I know she's got no body, but we should be probably around seven, okay? Seven or eight. Once this tube is in, do not let go, okay? You're going to hook up to the ambu bay and see if you have chest rise, right? But we have to hold this tube until it is secure. So, right now, am I doing a good job holding this tube? Why not? I'm holding the tube. I got a good grip on that tube. Until my colleague comes on and says, oh, I need to change the diaper and moves the baby. And I'm still holding the tube over here, right? So when you hold, always hold on to the chin with another finger. And if you can, even the top of the head, okay? So there's two ways I like to hold. One way is one finger on the chin and the other two fingers on the tube. Now if this head moves, I move with it, right? If someone decides to lift up the baby, it doesn't matter. I have a grip on this tube, yes? And I use my two fingers to hold it in. The other way is to put your finger in the mouth and pin it, pin the tube to the hard palate, okay? And then use your thumb on the forehead and your other fingers on the chin to keep the head in place, okay? And then I have my other hand squeeze the ammo bag, okay? And so we should, we need to be very diligent holding the tube until we have secured it, okay? Even if the cuff is up, the cuff does not keep it in. Sawa? So, these same methods I'm gonna use on, I can use this one on an adult, where I hold on and do this, right? Do I wanna do this one on an adult? No, adults have teeth. I don't want them to bite my finger off, okay? So don't do this one on an adult. On a neonate, it's fine. But I don't want to stand here forever and holding the tube. I want to tape it, right? So I'm not letting go of this tube. Someone is holding on to it while I get my tape, okay? What you're going to do with your tape is you're going to get two pieces of tape about the distance from ear to the other ear, okay? And then you're going to make it look like a pair of trousers. You see that? You cut it halfway. So it's a pair of trousers, yes? You like my trousers? Yes. <laughs> we are not allowing these, even if it is a girl, it will wear trousers. So now we take these trousers and we stick it on from the corner of the mouth to below the ear. Sawa? Then we have these two trouser legs coming out by the endotracheal tube, yes? I'm going to take the top piece, and sometimes people like to put the tube way in the corner of the mouth here. I don't like to do that because we can pinch, okay? So don't put it right, and the whole time someone else is holding my tube, right? We don't let go of tubes. So this is a two-person job. One is putting the tapes, and the other one is putting the tube, okay? So you're gonna keep it about in the, you can do the side or the middle, sometimes a little bit to the side. So I'm gonna take this top tape, and I'm going to carefully wrap it around my tube. You see that? And as I wrap up, I'm gonna spiral Kidogo, okay? So I'm not putting tape on top of tape on top of tape. I keep grabbing a new piece of endotracheal tube, okay? Does that make sense? So I'm gonna come around and around, and then I can decide as I come around, you know what, I have a lot of tape. Let me come back down, okay, to the, to the face. Or if it finishes, right, I can bring this back down to the face or I can keep going around, okay? Now I have this other piece of tape the bottom one, and I'm gonna come on top of that. And see how it's holding that tape I just did? And I'm gonna stick it all the way across. You see that? Yes? So, and then on real people, the tape sticks better, yes? But really force it down. Now I have one piece of tape. 
I'm going to look again at my numbers and make sure my tube hasn't moved. I'm going to make sure I'm toto equal sour. All right, make sure the sats are okay. And now, if I have one, I can be fairly secure, okay? And so my partner can let go now. They can relax Kidogo. Unless the baby is Sangha, 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 <laughs> then have them keep holding on, yes? Now we're going to do the same on the other side. So I don't like to put tape on the chin. Chins move, right? So if we tape there, they might pull it off. So what I'm going to do is... The same thing on the other side. So I go on the piece from the ear, put it on. Then I'm going to take this one from the bottom, bottom or top? Top. Doesn't quite matter. Some people get picky in top, bottom, and sometimes one works better than the other. But I'm going to wrap it around, come between. I don't want to close the nares because we want those to stay open. And I'm going to wrap it around my tube. Right? And realize one piece of tape I came around counterclockwise, anti-clockwise, and the other piece I'm going around clockwise. Okay? So it's being pulled both ways. Yes? So I'm going to wrap it around, and then the other one comes across and makes it all look smart. If I have an NG tube, I can put the NG tube in and have that piece of tape right underneath there, and put it in. Sawa? Then smooth it all out. And then before you walk away, make sure you're okay, right? Give it a little bit of a wiggle. Don't lift up the baby with the tube like I'm doing. <laughs> if it is someone, if they have a lot of secretions and your tape is not staying, you can also do a thin piece of gauze and tie it around and put it around your strapping. And so then the strapping helps keep it at six or seven. Where did we say we were? Seven, right? And the other one helps to keep it from being dislocated, okay? I remember intubating a few years ago with your CEO and he taped it like this and then he put gauze on top and then he picked up the baby by the tube and I went, I, and he goes, no, I know I did a good job. So, <laughs> um, I still don't do that, but, right, you want to make sure it's secure. Sawa? Swali? You saw how I did that? Yes. All right. We'll put baby on the vent soon. So let's go back to our slides. Where did they go? Where is my mouse? There we are. Okay. So back to our slides. Oops. All right. So we talked about holding the tube and anchoring it well, right? Depth is weight plus six. And double check every time you look at your patient, is my tube good? Because babies like to drool a lot, yes? So this tube can move, and if it starts to have secretions and it's starting to slide, then we need to re-secure, okay? So every time you look at that patient, confirm that it's okay. All right. So some challenges with the tube. It's easy for these tubes to kink, all right? Because you've got all of these tubings connected, right? To the tube, yes? And you come over here and maybe it is kinking the tube, yeah? If our tube is kinked, is the patient being ventilated? No, so you might need to prop it up on some towels. Right, something so it's nicely positioned, whether it's on the side, down here, but so it's not pulling, all right? With your flow sensor, if you get water in your flow sensor or secretions, it will start to misbehave, okay? So you want your flow sensor with these blue and clear tubings facing towards the ceiling, so it's hard for water to climb up there, 
right? So you're going to want to position something like that and then use some towels to pop it up. Alright, so that's one problem, kinking, obstruction. What happens if we get our tube becomes blocked with secretions? Okay, first, how will you know your tube is blocked? What will the machine do if the tube is blocked? So it depends. If you're on, if you're on volume control or pressure control, right? If you're on pressure control, is the machine going to be able to get the volume in? If the tube is blocked, can the volume enter? No, so you're going to have a really low volume, right? If you're on volume control, the machine's going to be trying to push that air in, and are you going to be able to get that pressure in, or that air in? No, so you're going to have high pressures, okay? So either of those alarms are important to pay attention to. That one? And so if it's obstructed, the first thing you want to do is get your suction catheter and see if you can suction the tube, right? So ideally hold the middle of the catheter, don't hold the end, try to keep the catheter as sterile as you can. Put that catheter down and see if you can get that catheter all the way down. If you can get the catheter all the way down and suck out your secretions, then you know what? Good, we avoided the problem, right? But if you're trying to get that catheter down and it won't go all the way down, and your patient is in distress, is this tube helping our patient or hurting the patient? It's hurting our patient, right? So what do we need to do? Remove it. Don't wait for Dactari, right? Remove it and call the doctor to come right away to help you put a new one in. And so for that reason, we should make sure whenever we have a patient on the vent, we have next to the bed an ambu bay and a mask, just in case. Because these tubes for neonates are so small, it's very easy for them to plug. Um, the other thing that can easily happen is the tube can dislodge, right? If the tube is supposed to be seven centimeters deep, if it comes out even a centimeter, it may be above the vocal cords and therefore out, right? And so you need to be careful that your tube doesn't come out. If the tube is out, you're going to see bubbling. You're going to have low volumes, okay? Low expiratory volumes. Um, your inhaled volume might be reading really high if you're on pressure control and the machine's trying to give lots, right? But the air coming back is going to be really low. Your patient, if your baby is crying, tunashida. If you can hear them crying, that means they do not have a tube through their vocal cords. Okay? And so again, if it's not in, we are not helping. Take it out, beg, and then assess the patient. Okay? Swali? All right, so what I want to do now is I want us to set up together our patient on the vent. Yes? Good question. What size do we use, right? What, you, what size you want to use is based on the baby's weight, okay? So a term baby, or sorry, a one to two kilo baby, you will start with a size three, okay? This is, how, this is what I remember, one, two, three. Um, a one to two kilo baby gets a three. So if they're over two kilos, you're gonna go the size up to three and a half, okay? If they're under three kilos, or under one kilo, you're gonna do a two and a half. Does that make sense? Um, and so you, yeah, one, two, three. One to two kilos gets a three. If they're over two kilos, three and a half. If they're really over three kilos, maybe if it's a five kilo baby with a diabetic mom, maybe you want a four. Right? And if they're small, if they're less than one kilo, two and a half, if they're really small, you might need to pull out a two. Um, 
when you intubate, it's helpful for the intubator to have two sizes of tubes. So I look at this baby and I say, okay, this one probably a three, but maybe it will be hard and maybe I will ask for a two and a half. And so we have, if we have both caribou, that when they look, they go, you know what, that's smaller than I thought. I need a different size. So what? Good question. Thank you. All right. So let's see if this works. Can we see the screen? Yes. You can't see the baby. You can see the screen. Okay. So for your vent, we've talked about before, before we use, we need to check the vent, right? We need to do the pre-op test. So the leak test and the flow sensor test before you use, right? You guys, rem Do you guys remember how to do those or do you want to review them? Una Jua? Who knows? One of you. Okay, let's review it. So, actually, let's start from the beginning. Let's start from turning the machine on. How's that sound? If I can get the machine to go off. It's long press, yes? <laughs> and there we go. Okay, so you have your machine. If it's off, you gotta hit the button up here, the power button. Yeah, that's not on the screen, sorry. Power button to turn it on. That one? So turn on the vent. And it's like a computer or a phone. It needs to do its initial initialization things, right? Um, you can scan the QR code and find resources online of more NIMIs, and we wait for it to do its thing, okay? We also, before we turn it on, have to put on the patient tubings, okay? So you have a tubing that connects um, to the side and they have to lock in and you have your flow sensor. Your flow sensor has a white one and a blue one and you need to plug them in, white one and blue one, okay? So, once we are on the vent, we have this option on the bottom for pre-op check, okay? Before you pay, put the patient on, you want to do that pre-op check. So you click here, and the first one it has is leak test. So we're going to hit leak test, and it says disconnect patient. Now it says block. So I block it, and I block it because so no air can escape, okay? And it's seeing if there are any leaks in the tubing anywhere, because we've learned that patients don't like leaks. We have a check mark to go sour, all right? Then we do the next one, which is flow sensor. And it says disconnect patient, so we do that. Then it says flip flow sensor, so you need this knee knee. You'll hook this here and here so the flow sensor can go backwards and it makes sure to go sour. And we just let it go. You just follow the instructions, okay? Then it says flip the flow sensor, right? So I put it back. Calibration in progress. Check mark, okay? Then the next one is the O2 sensor. We're not going to do this one because we're not hooked up to any oxygen right now, okay? So now we can go back to that main screen. So the first thing, if we're gonna set up for this patient is we need to put in our settings, okay? And we want to start with the mode, right? What mode should we start with based on what we talked about this earlier? SIMV? So we're going to do pressure control SIMV, okay? So PSIMV. You see that? So that's the mode we're on. 
and we're already on it, so we can get canceled. And then we're going to go to our controls. Okay. We've got a few controls. The this one is called delta p insp. Okay. So the change in pressure, the pressure control we're going to give. Okay. And so often we start at 15 or 20. What should we start with for this baby? Someone tell me a number. This is a 36 week baby that, um, that maybe has a mild RDS, has been a little bit hypoxic, not really bad. We're hoping a few days on the bench will clear it up. I'm not giving you any detail. 15, exactly. We have to pick a number to start, okay? Then our next one is PEEP. And we normally start at five, okay? FiO2. If we are begging this baby on oxygen, what is our FiO2? 100%, right? So if we are begging on oxygen, which is 100%, and our SAMPs are 99, do we need to start on 100%? No. If we are begging on oxygen and our SATs are 85, do we need to start on 100%? Yes, okay. So you need to see what's going on. For this baby, we're starting at 21 because we don't have any oxygen here, right? So just to keep the ventilator happy, we're starting at 21. Sawa? All right, then what else do we got here? Rate, what rate should we start with for the baby? Hmm? 35? 40? All right. And then we have inspiratory time. What inspiratory time should we start with? Point, point three eight, point four. All right, flow trigger. This is how sensitive it is to the baby's trying to breathe, okay? We want it to be sensitive, but we don't want it to be too sensitive. So we have to start somewhere and then see where we go, right? So we can start there. The other thing that this machine does is remember we are an SIMV and we have pressure support that can help out, yes? This machine automatically defaults that your pressure support level is the same as your pressure control level, your inspiratory pressure level, okay? And that's good, except if you're having trouble with a leak, okay? And if you're having trouble with a leak and it's breathing too much, then you might wanna reduce your pressure support level, okay? And so to do that, you have to check this little check mark for P sync. You have to turn it off. Then it will let you change your pressure support level to something else. Does that make sense? So let's do that. Let's make this one just for fun. Let's just make it zero. Okay. Sawa? So we have no pressure support. So it's just SIMV. We're giving a rate of 40. If the patient breathes more, they have to do it on their own. Sawa? All right, are we happy with the vent? Yes? Are we happy with these settings? Yes, no, maybe? All right, you can also put in the patient's weight um, and that will help you with some settings. Um, but don't, you will need, need to realize you are smarter than the machine, okay? For this child, I'm gonna say about three kilos, or sorry, two kilos, so we'll leave it as is. Now we hook up our baby to the vent, and I have no idea how well this baby will ventilate. And then we hit start ventilation, okay? Let's see what's happening. So the first thing you want to do when you hook your baby to the vent is what? What do you want to check? The first thing I want to look at is do I have chest rise? Is my chest moving, okay? And I look down at my baby, you guys can't see it, and my little lungs are moving, kidogo. I have a little bit of chest rise, sisana, okay? The other thing I want to look at is whoop, my patient SpO2, okay? And right now my patient SpO2 is 75, okay? 
And we are on a pressure mode, so I want to see what my volumes are, okay? Can you guys tell me what volumes am I getting for this patient? No, what, what is the machine telling me I'm getting? Zero. <gasps> oh, why am I getting zero volume exhale? Because it's a mannequin. The other thing that can be helpful to look at is go to monitoring. Um, and I think it should tell me inhaled volume somewhere. Mm, maybe not. Yes. You see that VTI? You see that? So that's, it's saying my baby is inhaling 100 mils. And it's exhaling zero. Therefore, where is my air going? It means I have a leak somewhere, right? And so if I'm trying to ventilate this baby like this, I want to look at my baby. I'm trying to stand so I don't block your view. If I look at my mannequin, right? Do I want to, can I adjust my head differently? So I can, right? Did that change anything? Um, why am I leaking so bad, right? I might want to put a bigger tube in, okay? So what else I'd like you guys to realize is what is the patient's, so it says on here, the leak is 100%, right? We are really struggling with a leak. Um, let me actually move this so you guys can see the lungs quivering. Okay, you see them quivering? But they are still getting some air, yes? So, are we happy with that chest rise? Are we happy with that chest rise? No. So, maybe I'm saying I want to change the tube, but I need to prepare and I need to keep the baby alive in the meantime, right? So, I might increase my pressure. We went to 15, and I might take this, you know, I might take it all the way up to 25. Are they moving more, my lungs? Has my chest rise improved? Hmm? A little bit, yes? Kidogo, right? We're doing a little better. We still have no volume, right? Um, what's great about your machine is it's recognizing that there's a big leak and it's not auto-triggering, which is great. My machine, yeah, wow. Yeah. So the machine, the mannequin can't trigger, right? But the machine is recognizing that and it's still giving a rate of 40. I just want to try something here. See how, so I can, if it's auto triggering, right now my rate is 200. Go back on the patient. My tube is also not very secure. I need to retake this tube because it's doing nothing, yes? Um, but keep an eye and watch for the leaks. Okay, so. But we said we can't ventilate like this, right? So we're going to extubate and reintubate with a bigger tube, and that bigger tube has no more leak. All right? You see? Now, what are our exhale volumes? So that's some minute volume. We want to look at tidal volume to start. Our exhale volume, 14. And if we look at our inhaled volumes, they, that was page two, 14, right? And our leak is 12%. You don't go to, yes? So this, now we're, we know what we're doing, right? That makes it a little bit easier, right? But this isn't always an option. Sometimes we have to ventilate with that leak. Sawa? But that was a really big leak. So now we want to look at our patient. And how much did we say this patient weighed? Two. So what's our volume do we want? Twelve is how many mils per kilo. 
Six. Yeah. So at 14, how many mils per kilo are we getting? Seven, right? Is seven okay? It's within the range, right? So we're okay, right? So we're getting chest rise with our new tube in. Our sacs are 100. Right? We are doing okay, yes? So, but because we're on pressure control, what's going to change if this lung gets worse? Maybe I give this baby pneumonia, right? I'm not letting that lung inflate so much. What changed? What's alarming? So what changed when I did this? Our volume has decreased. decreased. We're alarming. This one says low minute volume. All right. So what do we do? What's our pressure right now? It's already at 30. Do we like to go higher than 30? So the first thing you want to do is assess and see if there's anything we can reverse, okay? So listen to the patient and we listen and we hear all these crackles around the lungs. What should we do? Suction, okay, so you go, you disconnect the baby, you suction them out, and then you put them back on the vent. <coughs> How are we doing now? Improving, right? Our volumes came. Then we're, are we back to 14? No, but we're at nine. And what's, what's okay? We're supposed to be at 12, but what's acceptable? 10. All right, we're sometimes getting to 10, sometimes above, right? Is our, is our on pressure control, our volume's not going to be the same every breath. It's going to go up and down, okay? Um, and if we have to, we can even go as low as 4 per kilo, okay? So I'm going to say, you know what? We are doing not so bad. Sawa? Swally? All right, how long am I supposed to be teaching for? What time am I supposed to be done? Not two. Uh, At three, 5.30, midnight, one. I, I, seafood has shown up. I'm just asking. Now? Hmm? Am I supposed to be done now? I should have asked before I started. The circuit? We should not have to change a patient breathing circuit um, while the patient's on it, okay? If they are on, if for some reason the circuit gets soiled, you spill UG on it or something, I don't know why you have UG in NICU, um, but otherwise, these are unheated circuits. We don't have active humidity in these circuits. They're, it's a dry circuit, um, and so as long as it's fine, you don't have to be replaced. It. So neonates, it's very difficult to get an uh, HME that does not, so what an HME does is it traps the moisture when they exhale, all right? And the problem with an HME is the HME takes up space, okay? They're, you know, a few centimeters across and a few centimeters deep, they have sides, right? And so that size holds air. And so for an adult, it's maybe holding 20 mils of air. And if an adult is taking 400 mils, does it matter if 20 mils of air are lost? <laughs> a neonate is taking 10 mils of air, and we are losing 20. And so we call that dead space, okay? So dead space is any air after 
the y piece, okay? So this flow sensor is dead space, right? So when the baby exhales, the last air they exhale stays in the flow sensor. And when they breathe in again, that air goes back. And that air has CO2 in it because it was breathed out, right? And so this is why this flow sensor is really skinny. If you look at the adult one, it's fatter, okay? Because we're trying, we need to reduce dead space on neonates. The challenge is the HMEs I have seen in Kenya have too much dead space. They might be 10 or 20 mils or 30 mils. So it's okay for a pediatric patient, some pediatric patients, but, he, but definitely not neonates. Um, so unfortunately, we are giving our patient dry air. And so we have to realize that increases our risk for the tube plugging. Um, and so don't be afraid of when you suction to put a, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 cc's of saline down the tube to try to keep secretions coming out. Um, and realizing if you're gonna ventilate someone for a long time, it will cause problems. But you guys aren't at the point where you're gonna be ventilating someone for two weeks. Yes? You don't want to do that. But good question. So, but because it's a dry circuit and there's no humidity, we don't have to worry about that much bacteria or whatnot growing in the circuit um, because it's a dry environment. And if it, there is, it's, whatever is growing there is contaminated by the patient, right? It's colonized with the patient's own. So to routinely exchange circuits, no. If it's a heated circuit, some places change every two to four weeks. Um, yes, good question. So Ali and Guinea? So, yeah, so on the machine, for a new name, we're gonna set our TI, but we have IE ratio down here, right? You can see it says one to 2.8, okay? And so the question is, some machines make you control an IE ratio, and some machines make you control an inspiratory time, but they are controlling the same thing. So if I increase this inspiratory time, you will see that IE on the bottom changing. So if you are used to setting the IE ratio and you're going, it should be 1.1 to two, or I want it to be longer, you can still look at it as you are changing the value. Do you see that? Um, but generally, again, for neonates, because we want to be precise and make sure we're giving them enough inspiratory time, neonatal ventilators always have you set a TI. And so you can check it, also realizing when I change my rate, that also changes my IE ratio, okay? Because rate, Inspiratory time and IE ratio are all a triangle that makes the same math. They can be calculated. If you have two of those variables, you can always calculate the third. Sawa? Good questions. Swali and Dine? Okay, peak pressure and pressure support. Good question. So right now, to show you, let me put the pressure support at five. And just to demonstrate, we're going to drop our rate to 20, okay? So our peak pressure, our pressure control is set at 25, and our pressure support is set at 5. Sawa? So let's watch what happens now to our lungs. We'll see if I can stimu simulate this for you and see. So if the patient is breathing spontaneously, Right, I'm making the patient breathe right now. If you look at this bottom waveform, that's the volume, okay? Notice how we're getting small volumes and large volumes, you see that? And then also look up here on the pressure waveform, we're getting small pressures and large pressures, right? So the large pressure is my pressure control. Those are those SIMB mandatory breaths. The machine is giving a pressure of 25. Any of my extra breaths beyond my rate of 20, the machine is not giving that pressure of 25. It's just giving a pressure sort of five. So it's just giving kidogo. 
all right? And so you can see we are getting less volume and less pressure, okay? Because it's getting less pressure, less pressure support for those small breaths. If I go here and I turn on P-Sync, now oh, they're going to be the same. I'm going to put them both to 25. Oh, 24 and a half. 25. And you can see when I change this one, this one changed as well. Now they're the same, okay? So now, when I trigger, right, I'm still pulling the lungs, take breath. They look almost the same between the pressure support and the pressure control breath. Do you see that? Anybody see what's different between the two kinds of breaths being delivered? It's still synchronized. The only difference is the pressure supported breaths are quick. And the pressure control breaths are given with a little bit more time. You can see that little notch there of more time. Because on a pressure control breath, we're saying it's going to take place over 0.4 seconds. Pressure support breath is only as long as the patient takes it. Okay. So if pressure support and pressure control are set the same, they're going to look almost the same, okay? But realize if we have a leak, like we had over here, to give a medium leak, not a huge leak and not a massive leak. All right, so now we have, what's our leak percent? Are we still at 100%? All right, trying to create a small leak is hard. Because if it's a big leak, it realizes, which is good. I like your machine is smart. Um, and it doesn't let you auto-trigger too bad if you have a small leak. But I'm seeing if it will let you if you have a medium leak. Um, so see that, how we're giving breath, 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 breath for a little while, and then the machine realized it was all a leak? Like that? If that's happening, the patient's not actually breathing that fast. It's just leaking, right? Now, every time that's happening, we're giving a pressure of 25, okay? If I turn off the piecing, can I drop the pressure support down to five? Now, let's see if I can make it happen again. We're doing it again, but we're not giving so much pressure every time we accidentally give a breath. You see that? And so it's a little bit less dangerous of overventilating. So if you're having a trouble where it thinks the patient is breathing too fast, you can do two things. One of them is to change your flow trigger amount. So it's less sensitive, make this number bigger. Um, the other thing you can do is drop your pressure support so if it does keep happening, you're not accidentally overventilating the patient. Sawa? Swali and Guinea? That was a good question. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Mostly? Swally, should we end there? Keep going? <laughs> no. Umechoka. <laughs> <laughs>